Okay, the recording is now in progress, and um, I will start by um, introducing, well, myself first. So, uh, my name is Patrick Jansson, and I'm a professor of computer science at the Chalmers University of Technology in the joint department with uh, the Gothenburg University. I'm uh, in the unit of functional programming in the computer science division, and uh, um, we invented or developed this course six years ago. And uh, from just a few weeks back, we also got a course book online. Uh, so you can buy it from uh, Amazon and, and uh, Adlibris and other places. <clears throat> so um, technology tooling, as you might have noticed, I am an Emacs person. Uh, we use uh, Emacs for live coding, for uh, um, these ty types of uh, sort of overview files in the org mode and so on. Um, for example, there is the some code which is also available in the GitHub repository, which we'll get to later, which we can look at uh, in a while. And um, <clears throat> then uh, the course homepage is in Canvas. And that means that um, well, actually, it's, it's an open page in Canvas. That means that uh, anyone can see the main page and the links to the lectures and so on. But to actually do the um, assignments and the exam and so on, you need to be registered for the course for which uh, there are some requirements and prerequisites and so on. But I'm very welcoming towards other students who want to participate in the course, even if you're not registered formally. So back to Emacs, uh, as I mentioned, there is a book. You can see the, the front page of it on the right here. It is uh, co-authored by Chiesa Ionesco, who was the initiator of the course six years ago, and Jean-Philippe Bernardi, who was joined in later. Um, it's available, for example, from Ad Libris. That's the, the Swedish uh, bookseller, which is cheapest currently. And apparently, it's often bought together with the anarchist turn. So you can get <laughs> deals. I'm not sure there is any statistics present here because the book has just been available for a few days. So maybe nobody's bought it yet. Um, we have also the book available as a PDF in the in, well in the repository and also in the Canvas um, file system. Oh, so uh, Rust uh, is me. So there's some statistics behind it. Okay, it seems at least one person has gone into AdLibris to buy the book. So yeah, okay, good, good to see from the the chat here. Anyway, so the, the contents of the book is there, but it's not very expensive, so it might be good to buy it anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not very good to view it in Canvas, but you can download the PDF and, and search in it and so on. I should say that even though you can see um, Haskell code uh, in it, uh, if you really want to play with the Haskell code, please type it in or copy it from the repository instead because uh, otherwise you will get some strange uh, error messages from spacing return and, and problems and Unicode replacements and so on. Um, GitHub, I mentioned a few times now, there is a repository on the organization DLCs of math. Uh, it has some directories for old uh, years, and but the main contents is in the L for lectures subdirectory which in turn has subdirectories for the weeks. So 01 is week one, and it has uh, the main book material, but also things like solved exercises, exercise solutions, and, and so on. So there are a number of uh, resources here which could be useful. For example, the first chapter of the book starts with this file. Now it's, it's written in literate Haskell with lots of Latesh uh, interspersed, but there are some little Haskell snippets in here. Okay, let's see here. Some side says the announcement with the Zoom link showed an error when I wasn't logged in, which might mean those who aren't registered can't find it. Um, yes, I'm not sure that the 
I, I checked to, to go to the Canvas page within with um, um, the sort of anonymous mode of the browser and I without being logged in then and it still got me the main page. So I hope it works, but we can check it afterwards. Anyway, the GitHub repository, uh, as usual, um, it's it can be cloned so you can get all of the um, code from it uh, easily downloaded. And uh, if you find problems or bugs or suggestions, then do please uh, uh, send a pull request so that I can keep improving. I already got a one character fix in chapter zero from one of the students. I'm very grateful. So please keep up that work. Uh, Zoom, yes, well, we're already in the Zoom link, so if we don't need to click that one. Uh, Jamboard, I'm using this technology to uh, sometimes draw as I'm not at a whiteboard or a blackboard. Uh, I instead do it uh, on my tablet. And let's see now if I got it here so I can try it out. There's a slight delay from when I write it until it appears on screen, but it seems to work. And uh, there is a link to the Jamboard, uh, well, in the Git repository, um, but also in the, on the page, which I showed. Well, actually, I should go back to the course home page to the main link that there is a, there is the, the first page of the course, but there is also the lecture media page, which has collected here the links for the lectures, exercise sessions, course book, YouTube playlist, and Jamboard. So if you follow the link here, you get to the same Jamboard as I'm sharing, but in view mode. And the purpose of having it as a link here is that I can only show a rather small area because I'm writing on my tablet, so the font will be rather big, which means I will have to switch screen rather often. And this means that you may want to look at the previous screen or the one before that. And when you got, when you follow the link, you can page forward and backwards yourself uh, in the Jamboard. Um, okay. And uh, finally, I think I already mentioned it, but uh, I've got a YouTube playlist for this year's instance of the course. Uh, it has currently three little extra lectures for people not up to speed with Haskell implementing some of the basic building blocks. So I do hope um, these uh, will be helpful for those who have another background. Uh, it will also include today's lectures and, and the following lectures as uh, they've been encoded and uploaded within a day or so after the lecture, they will appear there. Uh, there is, I should mention, for those who are speaking Swedish, uh, a similar playlist from last year. Uh, so all the lectures from the 2021 instance are also online. So if you want to look something up already, then you can find something which is bound to be very similar to this year's lectures uh, from the last year's collection. Okay, those were the technologies, tools we're using. Any questions at this point? Some people have already asked things in the chat, but let's move on and, and keep doing that if you have some questions. Um, I, I, well, I, I should mention also, as I'm recording this one, um, I will, um, if you actually do ask questions, you will be heard in the recording. So you might not want that, but uh, you can always uh, type in the chat or you can uh, do it while we have these little breaks. I will use some breakout rooms now and then to uh, walk around and, and answer questions and have you discuss it. Anyway, back to uh, Emacs and the examination. So there are two compulsory assignments and a written exam. That's how you pass the course. So the assignments are done in groups of three, and there is only a pass-fail grade. Um, the written exam uh, is graded the usual way for Chalmers and Guy. And uh, you need, for the passing the course, you need to pass the lab and the written exam. And as a help towards the written exam passing, you got weekly exercises which can get you bonus points for the exam. So each week there will be one, a few uh, or one or, or so choice of uh, exercises. 
And uh, if you hand them in before the Friday exercise session, you can be uh, getting this bonus point. So the details are uh, available in the Canvas page um, and the exact exercises are in the book. And as I mentioned, the book is, you can buy it physically, but you can also read the PDF online so you can find exercises. For example, I think I've got it open here. And if I type exercise 1.1, then yeah, we'll find exercise 1.1 or 1.5 or whatever. So that's a reasonably, if you've downloaded it, a reasonably quick way of navigating in the book. I should also mention that if you run into some concept uh, like the different DSLs, um, that might be useful to check the index. So very late in the book, of course, uh, like the last few pages is an index. Uh, so a number of the con con um, concepts introduced are are available here. It's like, like a derivative, for example, then you can jump to page 35 where the derivative is introduced. Okay, so that's about the formal formalities of examination. Um, a reminder, some uh, the students from last year wanted to send a message to students of this year. Uh, the advice is spend time on the course. Spending time pays off. Um, so uh, it's not enough to just focus on the labs or just being present on the exams, uh, on, the, on the lectures, you actually have to do work as well. And my personal advice would be to try to solve all the exercises in the book. So uh, just spend time, spend 20, 25 hours a week on the course and you will pass it. And you'll probably get a great grade as well. Um, as usual, there is a course evaluation going to happen. There is a set of student representatives which have been randomly selected by the, um, uh, the program. And uh, this is the list. I have got, I think, a, re a reply from the four first, but not from Masud. So maybe uh, sometimes these random assignment of people at the course end up being people who are not taking the course, but hopefully you're all in there. Um, the point of student representatives is perhaps extra important when the course is online like this, because it's a little bit hard for me to get a, a feeling for your problems and troubles and so on. So I will make sure to schedule a meeting with these course uh, student representatives uh, within a few days so that we can set up a communication link and uh, get feedback from you if there are problems. So the rest of you can communicate to them, or I guess you can also ask me or the TAs questions. Um, another part, which is, uh, it's not random. We signed up with DNS. Okay, yeah, well, I've, the, uh, how they thought it was random, but okay, that's good. <laughs> then I got especially assigned people, which is great, have been experienced or wanted to be for this specific course. Um, okay, anyway, learning outcomes. So this is the course learning outcomes. So the intended things that you should know by the end of the course, it's divided into three sections, knowledge and understanding, skills and abilities, and judgment and approach. And under the first heading, uh, there is design and implement a domain specific language for a new domain. That should be something that you feel that you know how to do when you get to the end of the course. You should also be able to organize areas of mathematics in DSL terms. So this is this first learning outcomes is not really specific to mathematics. It could be a d new domain in uh, computer communication or in uh, the history of science, something that you want to have as computer support for. But this is then more specific to mathematics areas. And then uh, more specifically, let's make that line fit, uh, explain main concepts of elementary real and complex analysis, algebra, linear algebra. There's a little bit, it's like zooming in from general to specific here. Skills and abilities. So this is just knowing and understanding things. This is things you should be able to do. So develop adequate notation for mathematical concepts. So interesting here that I'm not just saying use adequate notation, develop adequate notation. So the thing is almost any field you go into, if you really want to compute and calculate with it, 
you need to have a notation which supports reasoning. And for example, it means being concise. It's probably not very convenient to try to reason if it's long, complicated expressions you work with. And uh, very often it's the case, even for a little exercise that you need to or, or benefit from developing some notation for that specific exercise. Um, there will be some calculational proofs, equality chains. Um, there will be two ways of solving differential equations using power series and using the Laplace transforms. And finally, the third kind of uh, learning outcome, judgment and approach. Here, it's a bit of a meta outcome, which applies to all of the others. So discuss and compare different software implementations of mathematical concepts. So part of this, is, uh, of this learning outcome is tested by the fact that the, the assignments, the sort of labs in the course are done in groups of three. So you will have to discuss and compare within your groups and uh, be, uh, well, that's a, a practice on that side. Okay, um, then I'd like to launch into some breakout rooms to start a discussion going related to judgment and pros, approach and so on. I will assign some random groups here and please within each group do a presentation round um, and try to share examples of potentially confusing notation in either mathematics or programming. It will be a 10 minute, uh, so that means that we should be back at 42 or so. Um, and I will now see if I can manage to get can, um, Zoom to do the splitting. Okay, now I think everybody should be back. So uh, the task here was, was to, well, brief presentation round and sharing some example of confusing notation in mathematics and compared to programming. And um, I realized that was a bit vague. Uh, things that uh, I've heard mentioned were anything to do with DDX um, and uh, integral oops, integral, and then some discussion about geometry versus algebra, uh, where things might be more or less confusing. Um, but I will now uh, move on to start with a little bit about um, what a domain-specific language is, and um, give a little bit of an example. There will be more after the break. So I would claim that a domain-specific language has four components. Some surface syntax that we will mostly ignore in this course. Uh, so from the linguistics point of view, a language is defined by a set of strings which are accepted by in that language. So a set, a set of strings usually defined by some grammar. We will not really talk about the, the grammars here. Uh, we will focus, we will start from the abstract syntax point of view. Uh, that's usually in this course then a, a recursive Haskell data type of syntax trees. So things which can represent expressions and then you can try to assign a semantics to them. So the next step, four, th third component is a semantic type, a type of values uh, representing the meanings for the syntax. So syntax is sort of a, a just data, and then they are supposed to mean something as well. And the semantic, the word semantics is a bit uh, overloaded. So you will both talk about a semantic type and about the function that assigns a semantic a meaning to each value in the abstract syntax. Uh, usually this thing is called eval. So it's a function from abstract syntax to semantics. Um, there is a link here for the definition on, on Wikipedia. But um, before we get into the first example, let me take one example of this um, um, use of um, the Jamboard. So let's switch over to the Jamboard, which is, I think, here. So now I think you should see 
So if, if uh, you get denied entry to this link, then you will have to look at it later. Apparently there is some kind of 50 person maximum. So I, I, um, I do hope it will be enough, but uh, and otherwise you can probably uh, check it later. So anyway, this, this is an example of a definition of a function f. I hope you're now seeing the screen where I have uh, some um, squared paper and the f of x equals the integral from x to 2x of x squared dx. So um, here is an interesting example of mathematical notation where it's a bit unclear what the scope is. So which variable is used where and how are they connected? So the x here is used in a little too many positions. And I challenge you to find a mathematics textbook which actually explains scoping for integral signs. Uh, scoping uh, about is something which talked about quite a bit in programming, but it's rarely mentioned mathematics. And probably what would be written instead would be uh, somebody had would, would have um, changed the variable names and written x to 2x of t squared dt or something like that. And this indicates, uh, well, I guess indirectly then, that there are two different x's. So if we use, we point to this x and says, well, I, I write blue here because I'm not sure if the color goes through properly. So this blue x is the same as this and this. But the other x is this x and this x are red x's, so not the same x. So that's why when I move to the next line here from this first expression to the second expression, um, I can change one set of variable of uses, the red ones I've changed to t, but the blue ones are unchanged. So I guess it's already unusual to have an integral with limits depending on the argument of a function, but this is certainly something which uh, would be possible to write and which for which you need to assign a meaning. So uh, this is an example of where scoping is not a, a potentially confusing notation in mathematics. And if you compare this to programming, you could say that in when you declare a function or a procedure or some kind of scoped construct, it's usually the case that you start with declaring a number of variables up front, often with their types. The notation here is a little bit backwards from that point of view because the last thing in the body of the integral is to some degree, you could say a declaration of the variable of integration t. So this t sort of uh, connects to the t before here. And I would argue that the key of what's being integrated here is actually the function. So maybe this, now I'm trying to make up notation here um, and it might not be, a perfect notation, but maybe this actually should be x to 2x of the function sk, which is the squaring function. So where sk of x is equal to x squared, or of course equivalent than sk of t equals t squared. So what I'm saying here is that morally speaking, the body of an integral integral sign should really be a function. So the thing you're integrating is a function and the notation usually used is a combination of a D, the name of the variable, and then the body of the function, this right-hand side. So that's a bit uh, an example of a confusing notation. And uh, there are of course good historical reasons for why this dt or the dx is used there. And it helps in certain calculations, but it causes no end of confusion when it comes to knowing what is actually dt. I mean, what is the type of dt or what, what are you allowed to do with dt? It's supposed to be something small, but not quite zero and so on. Anyway, so that's one example 
Um, if we move on to another potentially confusing uh, terminology in mathematics, it's when, when mathematics books introduce a function or, or a theorem depends on a function. It's very often says something like the function f of x. But I would claim that that's a bit strange because f of x, that's f applied to x. That's already a value. That's not a function. I mean, if, if the f would be the squaring function here, then that would be the same as x squared here. And if x is 3, that would be 9. 9 is not a function, that's just a value. So I, I would prefer to say the function f. And then actually, I would also like to, to be a little more specific and say the function f of type and then perhaps it's uh, very, very often in, in calculus, it's just real to real. A function f of type real number to real number. And uh, we can't see, ah, sorry. This is a typical mistake. So I pressed, um, I moved to the next page on the tablet, but not on my screen. I have to do it on both the screen and the tablet. So yes, yeah, sorry. Now you can see the function f of x um, and the one formulation I would prefer, the function f of type, for example, r to r. I mean, it doesn't say in the first one, but if it's, if it's a calculus book, it's usually a function um, from real numbers to real numbers. Uh, this brings us to talk a little bit about types, and we will talk more about types after the break, but just briefly. So what we see first here is this typical notation for the type of real number. A type, you can think about it as a set. So it's a set of all the real numbers. And uh, we have a number of other base types. We have Booleans, which is basically the set of just false and true, and uh, often also, also written uh, as a one letter B. Then we got natural numbers, we got all positive and negative numbers, um, we got the rational numbers, well, we got the reals, we got the complex numbers, and so on. All of these are what you would call base types. base types. And then in addition to that, we also got um, sort of type constructors. So the arrow here has a type on the left and a type on the right and creates a new type, the type of functions from R to R. So of course we can also have functions, whoops, now I, we can have the type of functions from bool to bool which is then the set of functions. Well, actually the notation is not obvious here, but functions which as an input has one Boolean, as an output has another Boolean. And actually I will fill in this one after the break because I think, at least I should check now if we got Solrun in place, she's one of the TAs. Um, Solrun, are you around? Where is my participant list? Hello. Yes, hi, Sudan mm -hmm. is there. I, I'll, I'll stop the share so you can show yourself briefly. Okay. Um, right, so hi, um, I just wanted to drop in and introduce myself. My name is Solrun and I'm a PhD student um, and I've been a, an assistant in this course once before, two years ago, and I'm looking forward to um, getting to know you all a little bit and um, and discussing the the course material with you. Um, and yeah, 
hope I'll see you, uh, some of you later today in the exercise session. Yeah, thanks, right. Sorun. Uh, we, we have two more uh, assistants, but they are coming on uh, at the end of the next section. Sorun had something clashing the meeting there. Um, there Sorun, as I mentioned, the, the, the experienced one here, the one who's been around before, the other two assistants are new for this year. Of course, they're, they're not new to mathematics or domain specific languages, but um, Sorun is the one who's been around for um, at least. Well, as you said, one instance before, and also written a paper with me about the course, a pedagogical paper about uh, the course and how how um, learning, how the learning outcomes of this course correlates with the learnings of uh, later courses in the uh, computer science education, which was very nice. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see, we still have two more minutes, so maybe I should actually fill in at least maybe now we had some time to think so you can consider what would be elements of this um, um, data type of functions from boolean to boolean i had started with a set bracket there but i haven't filled anything in yet um, does anybody have a suggestion um, about a possible function. Well, okay, identity and not. There's different suggestions here, and XOR, XNOR. Uh, so I'll I'll pick what I think is uh, reasonable. Uh, and identity and not um, yeah, is, is something I, I agree with. So I'd write id here and not. Those are both one argument functions, taking one Boolean, return one Boolean. Uh, while uh, and and so on are taking two arguments and true and false, uh, if that is meant as a function returning true for for true and false for false, then it's the identity function. Okay, and true and false. Ah, yeah. So we we've got constant functions here. Uh, so I, I'll write it as const false and const. Well, now I don't fit true, so I will just write t. So actually, these are all the four elements there are. So uh, there are exactly four total functions from a two element set to another two element set. And that's the basically the, the four possible choices for how what to do with false and what to do with true. In each case, we've got two choices. So it's two times two choices in total. So for the function space B arrow B, there is actually possible to enumerate all the values, and these are the four values. Uh, but let's now take this uh, 15 minute break and uh, return at 1415.